Hello again. It's been a while, but uh, got a good one for you today. Actually got a couple of good ones. Uh, another car just pulled in too that maybe I'll do a video on, but uh, this is a 1999 uh, Chevy Malibu with the 3100 V6 and it has an internal engine noise. And I am not gonna lie, I suck at diagnosing engine noises. Um, all I ever get is engines with rod knock. This doesn't sound like rod knock. So uh, I'm gonna try to come up with a plan to determine the engine noise without doing further damage to the engine trying to find it because I could listen to this thing for an hour and really not be able to tell. I, I know professional mechanics probably could take one listen to it, but um, let's go ahead and let you take a listen to this noise and then I'll talk about the strategy I'm gonna use to try to diagnose this without destroying the engine in the process. That didn't sound too good, did it? So uh, that is definitely an internal engine noise. Obviously, the idea is whether this is a rod knock or whether it's uh, a top end problem with maybe valves, uh, lifters, something like that. But uh, that's the idea is to rule out top or bottom end and see what we're in for. So um, the problem is, is that uh, there's a lot of things that can help you diagnose whether you've got a top or bottom end problem. The traditional way of testing this is, of course, you pull spark plugs one at a time. You listen for the cylinder that makes a change, if any of them do. If a cylinder makes a change by pulling the spark plug, then it's almost certainly a bottom end piston related problem, most likely, uh, most likely a rod bearing. The problem with me doing that is I really don't have a very good ear for that, and I'm really afraid of doing damage to the engine uh, in the process of trying to listen to it. Um, so I wanna try to do this diagnosis running the engine as minimally as possible and coming up with a more strategic method. And the other thing is I really don't like the idea of pulling a spark plug anyway. I'd much rather pull the fuel injector um, connection because that way if this is some sound associated with pre-detonation without fuel being in the system, I can isolate that. And also I'm not washing down the cylinders with fuel while I my inexperienced butt is spending 15 minutes trying to listen each cylinder, right? So what we're gonna do is take a approach like this. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is do some visual things um, and scan, make sure there's no misfire. I can tell you right now there's no misfire. I do have an ear for that. Um, look for an oil light on the car, that kind of thing. Um, the second thing we're gonna do, uh, actually, I take it back. The first thing we're gonna do is check the oil, which I did. The oil level is fine, but I do wanna make a comment on that. So. Um, Let's check the oil level. That actually should be first, I apologize. A little flustered today because I got a lot of cars here today. Um, the next thing we're gonna do after doing that is we're going to analyze the oil and look for metal particles or something. If there's a lot of glitter in the oil, you've seen in a previous engine video that I did, um, looking for bearing particles um, in the engine oil. If there's bearing particles, if there's glitter in the engine oil, then we're done. Also, if there's coolant uh, showing up in the engine oil, it's milky and stuff, blown head gasket, diluting the oil, there you go. The next thing we're gonna do is before again, we do the exciting part and find out where the knock is, I wanna test the oil pressure. Why do I wanna do that next? Because I don't want to be running this engine for a long time without oil pressure, trying to diagnose this thing and end up spinning a rod bearing and jamming the engine up and making a really miserable thing out of this. So I wanna verify that there is oil pressure. If there is low oil pressure, as far as I'm concerned, we're kind of done. I have to take the oil pan off anyway to look at the oil pump. In my experience, you know, a lot of times they change an oil pump for something like that. Oil pumps are pretty simple. Usually the oil pump works, it just can't deliver through the worn bearings and build up pressure. But either way, it, it's a bottom end problem, so we're kind of done. Um, and then after I test the oil pressure, if there is good oil pressure and I feel safe running the engine for a while to diagnose this, we are going to isolate top or bottom end. And if I isolate a bottom end, then I'm probably gonna do that rod knock test with a screwdriver that I have a video on. And if we isolate top end, then I'll probably go ahead and take a valve cover off or something and see if we can isolate the noise that way. Um, again, 
I just don't have a good ear for this. What I'd really like to do is be able to listen to the engine and tell whether it's coming from the top or bottom. As far as I'm concerned, I could be at the a muffler on the car and think the knock is coming from there, so whatever. But um, I will say it, it does sound to me like a top end problem, but I've got some tricks that I'm thinking of um, to isolate it, uh, including using a timing light to look at the timing of the noise and see if it's related or not. But uh, let's go ahead and follow through our plan here, starting with some visual information. Again, no misfires on this car. I have also ruled out that this is something like an exhaust rattle, which is very common, a loose exhaust shield. This is an internal engine noise, so we're making that assumption. Let's go ahead. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is turn the key to on, but not start the car. And I'm looking right here, we see that the engine oil light does work. Okay, so if there's low oil pressure that can be detected, we would hope that that light is going to work and the bulb isn't burned out or something. Let's go ahead and start it. And the light goes off. But we still have that sound, of course. So I'm not gonna trust that light. I'm still going to do a manual oil pressure. But had that light stayed on, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm probably done. But uh, this makes it a little bit more complicated. So let's go forward. Okay, so we did some visual stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and check the level of oil. Obviously, if there's no oil in the engine, well, uh, there you go. But I, I do want to make a couple comments on the oil level in this engine, which of course is the first thing I checked, just to make sure it's not just out of oil. Okay, so with checking the oil, um, when I first checked it, this is what I saw. It's uh, just a little bit low there but that's not enough. You see it's at the first little hole there. Um, that's not nearly enough that it, the engine is starved of oil or anything like that. Um, if it was any lower than that, I guess I might be tempted to go ahead and top it off with oil, run it for 15 seconds, see if it's just a matter of it not reaching the pickup pump. But I've ruled that out. What I wanted to show though is, did you notice something about the oil? Brand new, and this is very common when you get these cars that have the engine knock uh, problems because what's the first thing people do, they try to change the oil, see if it goes away. And uh, if you saw my used car video, I mentioned I specifically hate new oil in cars because now it makes it really difficult for me to see if there was coolant in the oil or metal in the oil um, because I'd have to run the engine a really long time to see if that develops and of course there's an engine noise and I might be doing damage so this really complicates matters and ensures we're going to have to move on down our flow chart um, I hate that I wish the oil was really old so I could see if this was um, some issue uh, that shows up in the dirty oil but we can't do that all right, it is not an oil level issue, so we're gonna move down and I'm gonna get a sample of the oil uh, from the oil filter um, or from the drain plug and just get a little bit of oil, see if it is full of metal. Okay, so here's my little pickle jar lid with a white background to help reflect and uh, I know this doesn't show up very good on the camera, but what we're looking at is mud. Um, there is coolant mixed with this oil and uh, you can also see there are some uh, unsettling big particles floating in there too. So obviously there is some major issue with this engine, blown head gasket maybe or cracked block, we don't know exactly yet, um, but uh, we'd have to do a compression test. All right, um, obviously I'm gonna go ahead and dig in later and find out what the cause of the coolant and the oil is, but we're gonna continue on with uh, diagnostic here obviously that was very helpful there but we're going to assume that it wasn't helpful in your case uh, again uh, rather than run the engine for a long time doing cylinder drop tests try to find out which cylinder is affected um, i believe the next best step would be an oil pressure test just to verify that while you're running the engine there is some oil pressure there i can imagine with coolant in the oil like that there's uh, definitely not going to be a lot but um, that would be your next step. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, if it's easy, I'm going to set up an oil pressure gauge just to show you. If it's really a pain in the butt to do it, then I'm just going to jump on to the next step on how to isolate the knock. So we'll see how easy it is to do this. All right, fortunately, the oil sensor is uh, located in a convenient spot. So I was able to hook up an oil pressure gauge here and uh, we will fittingly put, in, put it between the oil dipstick and the oil cap. And let's go ahead and measure some oil pressure. The 
oil pressure test is done and uh, 35 PSI is actually uh, surprisingly high. Um, that's pretty interesting. So um, in that case, uh, it's a little bit more evident that if you've got a high oil pressure like that, maybe it's not reaching the top end. Um, usually if you've got a completely worn out bottom end, the oil pressure will be just about zero. So uh, it also gives a little indication that maybe you can run the engine a little bit longer not really in this case though, because remember we got coolant going through there, so we don't really have lubrication um, because of the coolant situation. Um, I'm pretty sure this engine's shot anyway, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, I don't really need to go much further, but we're just going to finish off with the noise diagnosis to help you out in case you have to move further along, because uh, I really am not afraid of damaging this engine any further. The next step now that we know we've got some time on our hands with the oil pressure, because remember, if the oil pressure was low, you've got a bottom end problem by definition. The oil pump is on the bottom of the engine. You have to pull the pan, which means that you can inspect bearings and things anyway while you're there. Um, if that's not so easy to do, there's a cross member in front of the pan, like on most vehicles or something, we're going to want to use some technique to isolate top or bottom end of the engine. Um, the way I'm going to do it on this one, I'm going to do it two ways. One is using a timing light and, and looking at the pattern of the knocks compared to a timing light. The camshaft will, if it's an upper end that's going to be camshaft related, you're going to get one sound per flash or between flashes of the timing light. The crankshaft, of course, turns twice during a fire, and so you're going to get twice as many noises between flashes with a crankshaft. Um, so that would help you to isolate top or bottom end, but also an easy way to do it, cylinder drop test. If you remove the combustion and the noise changes significantly, it's related to the piston, right? Bottom end. So I think we're going to go ahead and do that. Like I said, I wanted to do this by pulling fuel injector connectors so I don't wash down the cylinders and also have no fuel in there if this is a pre, if they're trying to diagnose a pre-detonation noise or something. But uh, unfortunately, the intake manifold covers all the um, connectors, so we are going to end up do, doing the spark test. So I'll pull spark plug wires one at a time and we'll listen if we hear a difference in the noise. Um, again, like I said, I'm not very good at this. Maybe you, you'll be screaming at the computer like, what's wrong with you, dude? But let's see what happens. All right, so uh, what I'm gonna do is pull these spark plug wires one at a time. Um, well, yeah, actually, sorry, I was just thinking it, it might be easier for me to actually just pull them right up here at the coil. They're just all nice and right up there. The problem is the contacts are really close here and I'm afraid the spark's just gonna jump across and I, I'm afraid of maybe doing some kind of damage. So um, I think it's gonna be easier to just go ahead and pull these plug wires out and be safer. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the engine up and do this as quickly as possible so that I don't uh, spin a bearing and make a really bad day out of this. Huh. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little spark gap. This plug wire is bad. That's interesting. Go to the next one. No change. No change in the sound. So I'm a little frustrated here because the uh, back plug wires are really hard to get at and I'm not really going to be able to um, safely pull them off and everything. So I guess I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, pull them from the coil. The only thing is, is that you know, I'm really afraid these coils are just too close together um, and it's too close to metal. I can easily see the spark jumping and I don't want to do any damage. So what I think I'm going to do is go a little bit slower, do this one at a time, use a spark tester so that it's easier for me. Uh, so let's see, we did two, four, six. So let's do this on five here and this will create a little more gap um, so that uh, 
I don't also electrocute myself too, which I really don't feel like doing. Um, so let's see uh, how this works. Ouch. Okay, that kind of hurt. <laughs> Uh, I'm so happy that got caught on camera. That totally didn't work. Uh, so I did get shocked as I was afraid was going to happen. So uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, um, do these one at a time. Obviously, you can hear there's no change in the sound again. You notice the sound gets a little slower because of the misfire that we're causing, but the actual sound doesn't change. Um, which means that this is more indicative of top end. So what I'm going to do is do these one at a time. Um, let's go ahead and get this one off. I'm just going to start the car one at a time and not get shocked again. Uh, boy, that really sucked. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's not funny. Quit laughing. All right, let's go ahead and we just got two more to go and I'm done with this. Believe me, the sooner the better. All right, uh, well, hopefully I get some kind of superpowers or something after getting shocked there, but uh, you, you do have to be careful, and I kind of I thought that was going to happen. Um, so it seemed to me, and again, I apologize if you're listening to this going, God, dude, you really suck at diagnosing engine noise, but like I said, I just don't have an ear for it. Um, I listened right at the oil pan. I listened right at each rocker cover. Um, it sounds like it's coming more from the bank one side, the right side of the engine to me. Um, but honestly, it sounded the same to me from the rocker cover and the oil pan. I, I really still can't tell. Um, what I can tell is that it didn't seem to me that any of that cylinder drop made an effect on the noise. The noise was just as loud, it seemed to me at least, with every cylinder drop. So that's again leading me to believe top end, which I, I kind of thought it was to begin with. So what I'm going to do now is one last thing to try to verify if it's uh, top end. We're going to see if we can coordinate the timing of the sound with the ignition to see if this is bottom end or top end. Again, we'll have at least two noises per flash sequence. Um, either on the flash or more likely between flashes, we'll hear two noises if it's bottom end, as opposed to top end where we would have a noise synchronized with pretty much each flash or between each flash, so single noise. So that's what we're gonna try now and see what happens. And I've got a inductive timing light um, that I'm going to aim into the darker area and we'll see, uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I highly doubt that I'm gonna be able to even tell whether there's one or two knocks per flash, but uh, maybe you guys are a little better at it than I am. Let's just see what happens. All right, if you were able to tell whether there was one knock per flash or uh, more than one knock per flash, then I believe that you probably have considerably better uh, senses than I do because that looked to me like a whole bunch of flashes and a whole bunch of knocks and I couldn't tell a pattern, so whatever. Um, but uh, anyway, maybe you guys were able, able to uh, identify that noise. And um, what I'm gonna do now is probably go ahead and start pulling spark plugs and doing that little uh, test with the screwdriver to test for engine knock. I've got a video that'll explain what I'm gonna do. And what I'll do is uh, just go ahead and do that off camera and just close this out with an actual diagnosis of what the knock is coming from, whether it's bottom or top end. And then you can see and have the satisfaction if your diagnosis was correct based on all that. But uh, um, I just don't have an ear for it, and I still don't. One thing I have noticed that's a little concerning is as I've been running this more and more, the engine is, of course, warming up, and the knock doesn't get any better, which actually is indicative of a bottom end problem in that case. Usually top end problems get better as the engine warms up more. So, uh, but then again, that may not be the case because we've got coolant in the oil. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and find out exactly where that knock is coming from. I will let you know, and that's gonna be it for the video.